the pace of technology innovation is fast. We all know that. But what does that mean for the electric vehicles, particularly, tapping into all these uh, potentials? What areas are you specifically looking at, given where you are, your industry, and your country? Let me go to Francois first on that. Yeah, so basically, uh, in, in terms of new, new energy vehicles, I think um, two statements which are very basic, but I think it's really important and, and never, rem uh, never forget that first of all, what we try to do is to reduce uh, the CO2 emission, and this is why there is this movement to new energy vehicles. The second, the second one is that basically, wherever we want to push <coughs> new energy vehicles, one of the key points is that there is a reality, and the reality is for every region, every country different. Since 2009, um, the, the Chinese um, uh, new energy vehicles producers has taken um, a later pass on it, but has been very successful in developing. Uh, the production in 2023 of new energy vehicles was 14.5 million cars in the world, where 8.5 million were produced in China, uh, which is pretty amazing. And uh, Tesla is not anymore the biggest uh, electrical vehicle producers. Um, BYD has taken over, um, and uh, Jelly is number three. Having said that, though, there is, of course, an interesting combination of energy revolution with the automotive revolution. Uh, now to mention uh, the artificial intelligence. That's all at the back of our minds at this moment. So, Ben, how do you see that is likely to work? So, so for those who aren't aware of Oliver Wyman, we're a global management consultancy, 6,000 people around the world and part of the Marsh McLennan Group. But we do have a big automotive business. Uh, much of that business is based in Europe, and it's been an earthquake. But it's also been a wake-up call for the industry generally. European auto manufacturers are asking themselves, how do we compete here in China? How do we compete in our home markets? And more importantly, how do we collaborate as well? Uh, and to uh, take advantage of, as you've just pointed out, some of these more recent trends, especially in technology, thinking about the car not just as uh, a vehicle to get you from point A to point B, but also almost as an entertainment system. And that's quite a different way of thinking uh, about, uh, about the automotive sector. Uh, and that, in turn, really captures uh, the new China. And that is a China that has doubled down on innovation, a China uh, that is uh, innovating at speed and in a way that is unfamiliar to many of the biggest uh, global auto manufacturers. And so, uh, again, back to your point, they're really having to rethink how they do their business. And that's what is so exciting about China's participation uh, in the global economy and the role that it plays in industry. Uh, Mr. Minister, I'm sure you have uh, some input on that. Thank you very much. And the first one is that the Colombian government signed the Paris Agreement. Um, for us, it's very important to um, this uh, objectives that we are signed for. And this is a very high cost for every country, but, but it's even more expensive if we don't accomplish the things that we signed in Paris Agreement. That's the first thing. The second one is that we, right now, we have the National Development Plan, and is that our planning in these four years, and this document for us and the president told us that we have to put a huge message and a strong message to the world. And that's why our plan is called Colombia a Power of Life. That's the name of our planning. That's the name of our plan. The third thing is that we take the risk. And that's very important for us because one of the decisions that are very hard to take is that you know that in Colombia we have very, um, we have social problems and political problems. And the first thing that we did was to uh, double the cost of the gallon of, of, of fuel. And that's a very highly risk for us. And now, if you go to Colombia, the last year, the fuel cost like $2, and now it costs $4. And what's the conclusion of that? Is that nowadays, the last year, 25 and 30, almost 30,000 uh, vehicles are now electric and gas powered. And the fourth point that we want to point out is we have to do many uh, regulation programs and we have to give uh, many um, benefits to the people that believe in the program. Mr. Secretary of State, would you like to provide your perspective on that from uh, 
Cambodia's perspective. If we, talk, if we are talking about the NEV, we have to know first the people know well about energy car or not, energy vehicle or not. In reality, people, some people do not know very well about the NEV. How to use, what benefit get, getting from the NEV. This is the first problem. The second problem, some people bought the, the EV vehicle and use for a few months and then want to, send, to sell back. This is the reality in our country. What, uh, what happened? Is the first problem, the charging station is very, very few charging station in Cambodia, around the country, very few. And second, charging time taking very long time, taking very long time, and driving rain not too long, very short, maybe 100, 200 kilometers, and no more battery, and then no where to charge. That's I why uh, the country who produce the EV should consider about this. Make better battery for the car, right. long, long using, and also, also charge shorter the charging time. Tell me more about what do you make of the latest debate, whether it's about the batteries and also about the taxes regarding exports and imports of vehicle, EV, EVs particularly, including the electric uh, uh, three wheels and two wheels, um, and also uh, the interesting discussion about who is the largest player today. I think that in, in, in our case, in Colombia, we have a huge problem in regulation. We cannot come here to give this message and in the other hand, in Colombia, put all the problems to, to put these programs uh, in, in, our, in our city. So that's the big problem right now, regulation. I think that we have to um, facilitate, facilitate the things to, to our investors because if we don't get that, we are not going in the right uh, direction. And that's our main problem right now, but we are working on it. We are signing a different agreement, not just in Colombia, uh, agreements abroad, abroad the, the country. And I think that that's the important thing right now, that, they are we, that we're trying to uh, get better in our laws to get better decisions. Uh, so I think the EV sector's arrival has come at a point of time at which geopolitics clearly is more important than ever. Uh, a point at which uh, globalization has stalled uh, and is even uh, reversing where governments are more prepared to intervene and demand or expect uh, the localization of, of production. And so that means the development of the sector will be quite different to the development of the more conventional automotive sector over the last sort of several decades. There will be more local production uh, than, there, than there was in the past. There may be a little bit less free trade. I, I think you'll see um, trade within the emerging markets quite robust. I, I think tra trade between China, Europe and the United States will be uh, obviously uh, more challenged uh, because both or all markets have uh, well-developed uh, automobile, automobile sectors to protect. Uh, but equally, there are emerging national security concerns. We've spoken already that vehicles may become um, sources of entertainment, not just uh, um, uh, 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 a transportation um, uh, tool. Uh, and because of that, the software is now triggering, um, for instance, in the United States, President Biden has called for an investigation into whether the software installed into Chinese EVs is a national security threat. You might start to see more of these types of investigations happening, uh, and if so, uh, it means that um, uh, trade between, in my view, trade between the emerging markets may well be robust. There'll be more calls for localized production. Trade between China and the Europe, United States will be more challenged regarding the vehicles. I will come back to, to Europe uh, as an example because uh, Europe has uh, put themselves as, as a, a front runner, a pioneer in, in decarbonization. Uh, 
And what you have to be uh, careful in, in Europe is not uh, that um, ideology is taking over, uh, actually the final goal. And what we see is that for the first year, the, the, the sales of uh, NEVs has been uh, reduced, has been uh, going down in six of the countries of the European Union, especially Germany, um, because uh, basically um, the German, um, the German uh, government wanted to make a pause and they, they cancelled the, the, the subsidies for NEVs. Uh, because it was destroying value for the, for the other uh, um, car makers making combustion engines. And therefore, they try to balance. And I think there is also a need um, for, for the policymakers to understand uh, in a pragmatic way what is possible and not possible. First of all, um, in Colombia, our president uh, is doing a big effort to give all the security with loss. Uh, he's going to sign the next month uh, one law that uh, creates the fund of modernization. And with this fund, we are trying to modernize 45,000 taxis. That is a huge amount in our country. And we are signing as well uh, another agreement, like Agreement 58 of United Nations, that uh, in this case, we are doing a big effort to get better uh, vehicles uh, when we're talking about safety. So we, in one hand, we are trying to have a fleet, a huge fleet of uh, electric vehicles, but in the other hand, we want to have vehicles with safety to save lives. And that's another topic that is very important for us.